Some of you know my story, a lot of you don't. Uh, I was actually in the theater back in the 70s. Uh, I was a stage manager for a small theater company out in Dayton, Ohio. And I learned everything I needed to learn about being compulsive and, and uh, just uh, very, very organized to get a repertory company up and running and moving and staying on schedule. And it was much like our jobs we have today. You work eight hours a day, usually six days a week, um, but you can start till about noon, and you work until about eight o'clock at night, and then you party your brains out the rest of the night. <laughs> so it was, a, it was a pretty great lifestyle back in the 70s, uh, but it was uh, relatively unsustainable, as they say. Um, at that point, uh, you know, I ended up moving to uh, Northern Virginia, and I worked for the Folger Theater for a while in Northern Virginia. And uh, then eventually went to medical school in 1983. And in 1992, uh, I finished training at MCB, went into practice, and by 1999, I was totally fried. I was, I was completely burned out. Um, let's see if this is gonna work here. Yeah, I was completely burned out. And uh, I was recruited away to a small, very bucolic hospital up in upstate New York, uh, Mary Imogene Bassett, where people, few people know, Mary Imogene Bassett Hospital in Cooperstown, New York, was where the first bone marrow transplant was done back in the 50s. You're going to look it up in case he's taking what to say. But I stayed up there for about three years, and my purpose for moving up there, aside from being totally toast, was to take a little time out maybe learn a foreign language, maybe learn how to play a musical instrument. And what I found was that uh, I was pretty crappy on the violin, and uh, I couldn't have a lot of trouble finding somebody who would teach me Italian. <coughs> and my wife hated the snow. So as you know, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. <laughs> and uh, I ended up coming back to Richmond in 2002 and taking this job here, and I've been here ever since. Now, this is a, a study that was done by the Mayo Clinic. There's a, been a bunch of these studies that look at physician burnout. This was published in 2012, and this is fairly legitimate. We have about 7,200 people actually completed the survey. And I know this is hard to read here, but if you look at, uh, these are the specialties here, and everybody above this bar is ready to go postal. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I can read this. this is, uh, what is that? Radiology. So that would be that would be Snyder. <laughs> We're pretty lucky. He could have snapped it. We're here. Orthopedic surgery. Oh Christ! Doctor Ayers is here. <laughs> Keep him happy. Right. Don't take your eyes off of him. We got up here. General internal medicine. Doctor Ashworth still here? Oh, he got to see. He, he had to go do something. <laughs> he was about to to so you come down here. Here's radiation oncology. We're pretty laid back. Come down here. Here's pathology. This is where Turner is. <laughs> He's just barely got a pulse. <laughs> really, really laid back. So in any event, bottom line is that in medicine the burnout rate is higher than it is in, in most uh, professions and whatnot. And there's been a lot of evidence that um, it affects patient care, uh, it affects our interactions with our, our family members, and that we need to, to do something to, to take some of that stress off. So once I got going here, uh, I needed to find some sort of an outlet. And I really didn't have any idea what I was going to do. I, I thought about a lot of things. I thought about doing something exciting, uh, but uh, in the end, bullfighting really wasn't going to be my thing. I just couldn't do that. Other people said, try fishing. And I just really couldn't do it. I was always nervous about the size of the boat and everything. I just, I just didn't. And then finally, in 2007, I was asked to audition for a show by this, these people at the St. Michael Theater Group. And you know, it's like any organization. When you start asking around, you find out that people that you have the least, uh, you would least expect uh, have a, a, a fountain of talent that you can tap into. A couple of guys that I went to uh, medical school, it turns out they were in professional theater before they were in the medicine. I said, how, how would you know? So in this group of people, there are a whole slew of people. This guy's a professional actor. It's Chris Yarborough. This guy sings like you wouldn't believe it. These are, these are the guys on the, uh, the salesman on the, uh, the, the train to Rock Island in the music band. So you know, I sang in the ensemble, got to dance a little bit, a little bit of acting. 
The very first night, though, if you've ever seen the Music Man, you know, the show opens with the salesman on the train. All right, it's a very rhythmic scene. It's a very hard scene to do. But at, at various points in that scene, salesman number four, this guy, pops up and goes, what do you talk, what do you talk, what do you talk, what do you talk? <laughs> I did that, and people broke out laughing. And I was like, oh my god, I'm funny. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> funny. So this one on every night, absolutely, I was totally hooked. Absolutely love it. So from that point, I started looking for other things to do. And I plugged into something called the On the Air Radio Players, which is funded by Henrico County. It's just, this is basically live radio theater. And the nice thing about this was, you didn't have to memorize anything. You went and you auditioned with a group of other people who just stood up and read out of the script and they'd say, well, I need somebody to sound like they're from uh, England or something, so you put on a British accent and do that, and whatever. And uh, I, I got cast on a bunch of these things. Uh, I did Chris Pringle on Miracle on 34th Street. This was actually on the radio, uh, some obscure little radio station. Um, Nick Charles and the Thin Man, you know the Thin Man? That's one of, the, one of the great movie franchises ever. The, the, the original Thin Man opens at a bar in New York, in black and white, with William Powell showing the bartender how to shake a shaker for a martini. Mm -hmm. That's a great opening scene. Uh, Sam Spade, the Maltese Falcon, very fabled winner. I have to play Sam in that. You were right, you drew your coffee. And then uh, the professor is from the 39 Steps, and then there were a couple other ones I did as well. These are all available online. You can download all these things and listen to them. They're actually very good. They last about 30 minutes. So from there, I got asked to audition for Oklahoma. <laughs> And this is another St. Michael Theater Group uh, uh, gig. But for these big musicals, you know, we hire a union orchestra, bring them in, and you know, if, if we don't have the right people, we'll bring in a ringer or two. But uh, in this one, I, I was cast as Andy Carnes, and if you know the show, this is just a, a terrific uh, part, uh, playing the part of uh, the father of Ado Annie. So this is in the first act, and I had to grow out my beard, grew out what little hair I had. And, uh, and this is, uh, as I said in the first act, I'm confronting uh, Ali Hakim. <laughs> but I also got my first solo singing role in this thing. And at the top of the second act, there's a there's a, a huge number. It's the picnic where everybody gets together. The farmers and the, uh, uh, the ranchers come together who are at odds. They come together for this big picnic and whatnot. And Andrew sings a song to bring the farmers and the cowmen together. And it's a again first solo singing role, and I have to admit I was absolutely scared to death. But all you can see, you can't see anybody out there. It's just a big white light. All you can see is the orchestra down there, and see all this. But it's a great experience, and it went, went very well. I was, I was very very pleased with that. There's actually a, a, a video recording of this floating around. So it's actually pretty high quality. Uh, from there, uh, I got cast as Chris Pringle in a stage production. Of uh, Marathon 34th Street uh, back in uh, 2009. And the daunting thing about this was right after Oklahoma, I shaved off all my hair, shaved off my beard. Thank God, I feel much better. About a week later, I went to audition for this. I got the part, she said, Well, you're going to have to grow your hair and grow a beard up. <laughs> <laughs> and start all over again. This was a really experienced cast. These are some, some actually better well known actors in uh, Richmond in this thing. And, and then it was me, of course, who was you know, sort of the newbie in this whole thing. But uh, that was pretty exciting. It was a, a reasonable line load. Um, and we'll talk about how to memorize lines on so but it was a, a reasonable line load and uh, a cast that was uh, was very experienced and the record was just fantastic, Lord Fulmer. So then, uh, this, was, this was a unique experience. This was uh, the, the show Curtains. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of this show. This is a terrific Broadway show. Saw it up in New York a couple years ago. David Hyde Pierce, who played Frazier's brother on, on uh, Frazier, uh, had the lead in that show, won, won a, uh, a uh, Tony for that. Um, but in any event, I, when I saw the director of the lead, I said, I've got to be in this show. So the deal for this one was, you have to sing. So the, the way this works is you come into a room, there's a whole bunch of people in there, and you have to bring 16 bars of music with you, you give it to the piano player, and then they'll call you and say, well, Tom, what are you gonna sing for? I say, well, I'm going to sing, uh, try to remember from the Fantastics. And uh, unfortunately, it was, it was really interesting. I listened to these other people ahead of me, and I'm like, oh, I'm so screwed. <laughs> I'm so totally screwed. These people are so good. And 
as it turns out, I did not get a part in that show that required any singing. I got the only non-singing part of the show, the only non-dancing role in the show, as Sid Bernstein. And uh, Sid ends up being murdered in this show. And this begins a string of shows where I either die or I appear in my underwear in the show. <laughs> And at first I thought, well, what a coincidence, that kept happening over and over and over again. <laughs> so this is Nancy McMahon, this is one of my, one of my theater wives, and uh, Carmen Bernstein, first of all, actually murdered me. So this was, this was by far, I think, my, my favorite show. This is The Odd Couple, that was done in August of 2011. And I was cast as Oscar Madison in this thing. Uh, hey, uh, I looked at that script and I said, Oh my God, this is a great script. Oh my God, there's 90 pages of dialogue and you're in all of it. So I was absolutely petrified at the thought of trying to memorize all that. But what I found was that I found all these little tricks that I didn't know about to, to memorize lines. People do it different ways. Now, the guy that played uh, Felix, uh, Ed Polich, who in this scene is locked in the bathroom here in the first act, um, Ed would memorize a page a day. I'm like, I can't do that. I mean, that's just too slow. So I try and rip off about five or six a day. And then the next day, take five or six more and then go back and do the other five. So I just built the whole thing. So by the time we got to uh, on the stage, I was, I was completely off book and Ed is still trying to figure out the second act. <laughs> so uh, this show uh, played uh, six nights, sold out every night. Um, this was one of the most enjoyable shows I've ever done in my life. If you've ever read the script, it's fantastic. If you ever had a chance to see this show, any place, go and see it. It is so well written. Uh, it is worth the effort. Um, and scene two in this one, I just rode partially on stage in this and run around in my shorts uh, arguing with, uh, with uh, Felix. But this was uh, by far one of my, my favorite moments in the theater. This guy right here, Scott Garka. Scott will be appearing in uh, Enchanted April at Chamberlain Actors Theater uh, beginning in uh, March, I believe. Uh, Murray down here, Roy, Speed, and many poker players. <coughs> After that came the uh, Enrico Theater One Act Play Festival. That was uh, in 2012. And these are scripts that are submitted by people from all over the country. But we, you know, I was on the board at the time. We picked uh, three scripts. And each show lasts anywhere from 20 to 45 minutes. So this is one of the shows, number four, Three Gables Run. And this guy here, Aaron Orensky, is now starring in uh, The Joshua Plant, which is over at Chamberlain Actors Theater. Got great reviews in the paper, he's a great guy. He runs a fight school here, a theater fight school here in town as well. And uh, I was cast as this, uh, this sort of uh, Russian uh, art dealer. And uh, Nicholas from Austin. And this show was a real dog, it really did stuff. It was really <laughs> Neither one of us knew what we were supposed to be, what we were supposed to be, what we were supposed to be doing. And the playwright actually came back from New Jersey to see the show. So there was speculation that my character was actually a vampire. It never comes out anywhere in the show, but there was speculation my character was a vampire. So we asked the guy after the show, he says, so what's, what's the deal with my character? Is he a vampire? He goes, oh, no, I don't want that. I never thought of that. Like, OK, what is he supposed to be? He had no explanation. He had no explanation. This is a terrible show. So if you ever get this, you see this. So, I was at a Christmas party in 2012, and, or actually 2011, and this director that I worked with before, Lord Walter, came up to me and said, you, I want you to audition for this show called Catfish Moon. It's going to one in uh, June of 2012. And I didn't know anything about it. I bought the script, I read it, I loved it. Uh, audition, and the way these auditions work is you come in, and they give you a, what's called a side. And what it is, is uh, a series of, of, of lines uh, with another character. And you just stand up there and you, you talk with this other character. And there's some dialogue there. <coughs> and really, it's, it's all about the look, is what I found out. It's all about the look. The director usually has an idea of what they want that character to look like. Okay? And, you know, if you can talk and walk and you look right, you're going to get the part. If you can walk and talk and you don't look right, you're not going to get the part. This happened to me two weeks ago. I auditioned for Enchanted April. I had a great audition. I was very happy with it. It was terrific. I'd read the show before, read all the sides. I was on my game. I get a note from the director. You were great. We love you. You're too old. 
So, in any event, uh, this this uh, audition went very very well, and I ended up being cast in the lead role as Curly. And um, this was a, a very very funny show. Um, it, it, you know, I could tell you stories all night about different things. Like, for instance, at one time a rehearsal here, the lights go out between acts, and all of a sudden you hear this big crash. And I had fallen off the stage in the back. <laughs> <laughs> you okay? Yeah, I think so. Well, no, bruised up a little bit, but yeah, I fell off the stage. The other thing in this show, there were two other men who were in the show. There were only four, it's a four-person show. And the other two guys were really not enamored of memorizing lines. Let's put it that way. The script was sort of a guide. Right. So you never knew when you were out on the stage what was going to come out of their mouths. So you had to know their part as well as your part. So that you could kind of cover for them. It was very, very challenging. And the last show, I remember, forget this, the last performance of this, uh, this uh, production, the character uh, Frog was gentle here. Anyway, uh, Chris completely forgot his line. Totally forgot it. He just looked at me and goes, what am I going to do, Curly? I look and I said, I don't know, but you better figure it out really quick. <laughs> this, is, this, is right, this is right in the middle of the show. So he, he pulled it together and pulled it off. But I mean, this is what we were up against every single night. You never knew what people were going to say. So this was this was a terrific experience. This ran for uh, for three weekends, which is a typical run for a theater of this size. You know, CAF has been around, Chamberlain Actors has been around for 50 years. Who knew? That's 50 years. Uh, then you got places like Virginia Rep, who, you know, the combination of uh, Barksdale and Theater 4, that's right, Barksdale and Theater 4, um, have been around yeah, probably 40 years, something like mm -hmm. that. And then you've got all these other little professional theater companies in town, so there's more professional theater in, in a city this size than any place I've ever seen. So in this show, um, I uh, spent a fair amount of the second act in uh, the studios. And ended up dying in this show. Uh, hard <laughs> so you got to do a dancing force. Yeah. <laughs> the thought of doing this whole thing in my shorts occurred to me, but I. <laughs> but anyway, uh, that summer I was invited to uh, the award ceremony, and, and uh, I actually thought it was a great opportunity to meet some of the other actors and whatnot. And I actually didn't know what it was. I thought it was, you know, the time you could go and have a few drinks and you know eat some free food and whatever. And I found it was, a, it was a bona fide award ceremony. And, uh, you know, one thing led to another, and uh, I ended up winning this award. I was very, very surprised, very, very humbled. And um, talked to a few people around town, and there are several really well known actors in town who won these things. So I thought, geez, I'm, I'm in rare air in Richmond here. So that was pretty cool. Um, in the winter, uh, that, that last show led to this show. And sometimes you have to block. <laughs> you want to get a part, sometimes you just got to tell a little, little bit. So the director of the show came up and said, can you, can you speak with a French accent? I said, of course I can. I said, I have no idea. So, uh, you know, a quick order, a disc, you know, how to speak with a French yeah. accent. I want to sort of cram that all in. And, uh, and then at the audition, uh, you know, which actually this is at the callback. And the callback is you get through the first wave of the audition and they send out the people they don't want. Then they bring back the Know, the people that they're really interested in casting, and then you they start pairing people up again, and then they'll prune it down from there. So this is at the callback. They said, uh, "Okay, we want to spring something on all of you. We're going to see how you dance." And I'm like, "Dance? I don't dance. It's not something in my skill set." So I go, "Okay, I can do this." So somehow I, I faked my way through that, and I got this part. It was unbelievable. So in this in this show, I play uh, Jacques. Who, uh, Jacques doesn't have a last name. He's just Jacques. And um, he uh, actually acts as the voice of wisdom to his grandson uh, on matters of, of, of love. This is a romantic comedy. And this is uh, in the second half of my, my wife, Peyton Drake. The, the, now, the interesting thing about this show was this, this woman hated me. She actually hated me. And I, and I don't know why. And uh, we had a lot of discussions with the, uh, with the producer and whatnot, but she just, we just did not hit it off well at all. And we had to be you know, intimate. <laughs> <laughs> this was as far from her way of thinking as could be. So there's probably, you know, a millimeter of air between us. Okay. She was just not having any of it. So we 
people, <laughs> people, seriously, the only people that cast the last night said, oh, come on, go after her. <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> so this was uh, our entry. Right now, right now, the, the uh, Acts of Faith Festival is going on now in town. There's, there's a whole bunch of shows open this weekend and next weekend. These are all part of this thing called the Acts of Faith Festival. And uh, this was our entry into that last year. And we we uh, spent a lot of time doing video stuff for this as well. But this was, this was a great uh, great show and a great opportunity and whatnot. And uh, I guess I, I actually was dead through this whole show. I was an apparition. Uh, spent uh, time in my boxers, as you saw last night. And then I had to die again. Uh, like I wasn't dead already. So I had to die one more time. <coughs> now this guy, uh, Alex Iris, uh, Alex just graduated from BCU with a uh, uh, BFA in uh, uh, theater arts. He'll be heading off to Chicago here soon. Uh, Tyler Weaver, who's not who's in the show, but not in this uh, in these pictures. Tyler's up in New York now. He, he graduated uh, about a year ago. He's up in New York. And uh, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of being on stage with some some really really talented people. Um, it's an interesting outlet. You know, people always say, "How okay, how do you memorize all that stuff?" Well, it's like anything else. You just do it methodically. I mean, the doctors know what we do is largely this, okay? We memorize a whole bunch of stuff and then we put it out there, okay? It's just that this is you're, you're kind of laying it all on the line. It's live theater. Anything can happen. Anything can happen. I mean, there was in curtains a sandbag dropped in the middle of the scene one time, right in the middle of the stage. It's just like, where the hell did that come from? <laughs> you know, it's just the craziest things can happen. Um, music Man break scene where uh, Marion the librarian is standing on the porch and she's calling to her little brother Winthrop. Okay, Winthrop! And uh, no Winthrop. Winthrop! No Winthrop. <laughs> Turns out that Winthrop is sitting there playing with a little truck and a little car in the green room and forgot his cue. He's <laughs> <laughs> be out there and all of a sudden you see this kid. Winthrop, I know you're out there somewhere! <laughs> and so the kid comes tearing in. <laughs> Lands on stage there, and I was like, oh, God, thank God. There's no place to go. There's no place to hide. So, so anyway, I, thank you for your attention. And uh, I think we probably have a minute or two to take a couple questions. I don't know. But uh, again, it's about uh, talent, imagination, and me. <laughs>